So section 4.3 is about what we call logarithmic functions. Logarithmic, which is a very strange word. Uh, this may be new for you. Um, and I know chapter 4 so far has seemed like it's been skipping around a little bit. Remember in 4.1 we did something called inverses. And then in 4.2, we talked about a new type of function called exponentials. Well, 4.3 logarithmic functions is actually going to link these two together. It's going to link together inverses and exponentials. And when we link together inverses and exponentials, we get this new kind of function called a logarithmic. Okay? It has tons and tons and tons of applications in the real world, a lot of science applications, um, things like uh, the Richter scale that measures um, how bad an earthquake is. The magnitude of an earthquake is based on logarithms. Um, decibels, you know, when you, when you hear a, a noise and they talk about how loud it is, um, the scale that they use for measuring how loud a noise is is based on logarithms. Algorithms, um, the pH scale. You talk about how acidic or how basic um, something is. You know how acidic an acid is or whatever. That's based on logarithms. Um, so there are lots and lots of applications of logarithms in the real world. We're just going to kind of get a sense of kind of how they work and how they connect back to inverses and exponentials because there is a relationship there. Okay. All right. So we're going to start out. We're going to talk about this one inverse function. Um, y uh, equals 2 to the x. Okay, so we're going to make a little table of values for it, and we're going to plot it right up here on this graph. Okay, so if I had y equals 2 to the x, and I put in negative 2 for x, I'd have 2 to the negative 2. Negative exponent means stick it on the bottom. So 1 over 2 squared, which is 1 fourth. Okay, so when x is negative 2, y is 1 fourth. If we put in a negative 1, 2 to the negative 1 would be 1 over 2. 2 to the 0 would be 1, 2 to the 1 would be 2, and 2 squared would be 4. And we talked about those in 2.2, so hopefully that's nothing new. So we're going to plot those points. When x is negative 2, y is 1 fourth. When x is negative 1, y is 1 half. When x is 0, y is 1. When x is 1, y is 2. And when x is 2, y is 4. We graphed that the other day. We are familiar with what that looks like. And we can connect those dots and draw a really nice graph. Okay, a few reminders about that graph. Remember, it zooms up on the right. The left side, it's leveling off, okay? Uh, remember the domain of that function. It goes left forever and right forever. So the domain is negative infinity to infinity. The range, it starts basically at zero and works its way up. So we say that the range is zero to infinity. And we parenthesis the zero because it does not touch zero. It just gets close to it. Intercepts, okay, so, well, it does not touch the x-axis, but it does touch the y-axis. So it has a y-intercept at the point 0, 1. So I'm going to write y-intercept at 0, 1, okay? Asymptote, remember, asymptotes are the imaginary line that the graph gets close to but never touches. We have a horizontal asymptote right here. I'm going to label that HA. And that equation is y equals 0. It does not go up or down on the y-axis. The y value is always 0. So I'm going to label that it's got a horizontal asymptote at y equals 0. And then they ask us if it's 1 to 1. Now remember, 1 to 1 means that the original is a function and the inverse will be a function. Well, the original is definitely a function. It passes the vertical line test. The inverse will be a function because this passes the horizontal line test. If I draw horizontal lines, I never touch a point more than once. So that means the y's are not repeated. So when I trade the x's and y's to get the inverse, the x's won't repeat. So yes, this is a one-to-one -one function since it passes both the vertical and the horizontal line test. Okay, we talked about that in 4.2. What does that have to do with logarithms? Well, let's connect back to inverses. Inverse just means trade the x and y. So if these are the ordered pairs in my original function, my y equals 2 to the x, I bet we already know what the ordered pairs are going to be for this inverse. We do not know the equation. They did not give us the inverse equation. But we still know what the ordered pairs of the inverse are going to be. We know that the point 1 fourth negative 2 will be on this function. Because if we trade the x and y, that's what we'll get. We know that the point 1 half negative 1 will be part of this function. We know the point 1 0 will be part of it. 2 1 
and 4, 2. We know that those ordered pairs are going to be on this inverse function. Let's plot them, okay? So if x is 1 fourth, now that means we barely go past 0, just barely into the positive x territory to 1 fourth, the y value is negative 2, and I put a dot. If x is 1 half, so halfway between 0 and 1 at 1 half, the y value will be negative 1. 1, 0, 2, 1, and 4, 2. We know that those points are going to be on this inverse function. We can connect those dots, and we have a really nice graph, okay? Now, I would point out that even though we don't know the equation yet for this function, we know what it looks like. We know what the inverse function of y equals 2 dx is going to look like, and we also know these features down here. We can look at the graph. Or we can just think about our knowledge of inverses and we can answer these questions. We know that the domain and the range, when we find the inverse, will switch. So the domain of the inverse function will be 0 to infinity, and the range will be negative infinity to positive infinity. Let's verify that. The domain, sure enough, looks like it, the graph is zooming up to the right here, but it's dropping here at 0. So 0 to positive infinity is our domain, and the range, the graph drops forever and goes up forever. So the range is negative infinity to infinity. Okay, so we knew that before we ever looked at the graph, but we can verify it on the graph. Intercepts. Well, the original function had a y-intercept. This new function, the inverse, does not touch the y-axis, but it touches the x-axis at the point 1, 0. There is an x-intercept at 1, 0. Notice that point very carefully. Remember how we said that 0, 1 was a good point to kind of memorize for our exponential functions? Well, the point 1, 0 is a good one to memorize for these inverse functions of exponentials. Okay? Um, it's a mirror image of that 0, 1 point. So 1, 0 is our x-intercept. Asymptote. It does not have a horizontal asymptote but there is a vertical asymptote. Notice how this graph looks like it zooms down right here. It approaches this vertical line, this vertical asymptote, but it will never touch it. And the equation of that vertical line is x equals 0. The y values go up and down, but the x value of every point on that little imaginary line is 0. So there is a vertical asymptote at x equals 0. And is this function one-to-one? -one? Well, yes, it ought to be. The original is a function, and its inverse is going to be a function because it passes the horizontal line test. Okay? So, yeah, if the original was one-to-one, -one, then the inverse should also be one-to-one. -one, okay? And there's one more thing I want to point out to you about this graph. Remember how we said that inverses have a line of symmetry over the line y equals x. In other words, if I made a table of values for the line y equals x, no matter what I put in for x, y would have to be the same thing. So 0, 0, 2, 2, negative 1, negative 1, etc. If I plot those points and connect my dots, I have drawn the line y equals x. Notice that this original function, I'm going to label that original function as f of x, and the inverse function, I'm going to label the inverse function as f inverse of x. Remember that little negative 1 does not mean to the negative 1. It means inverse. Okay. The original function and the inverse function are mirror images over the line y equals x. If I were to fold my paper on the line y equals x and crease it, these two parts would match up. It would fold over and match. Okay. Okay, so notice what we've done. We graphed an exponential. We graphed the inverse. We found lots of ordered pairs. We drew the picture. We know the domain and the range. We know all these details about this inverse function. What we do not know is the equation. Okay? So we need to figure out what the equation is of this inverse function that we just graphed. Okay? All right. Well, we remember from 4.1, from when we first learned about inverses, that step one of inverse, finding an inverse equation was to trade f of x for y. To say, hey, this equation is really y equals 2 dx. And then we said we would swap the x's and y's. We would interchange them. So when I interchange them, I get x equals 2 to the y. Well, that's the inverse right there. We found it. 
The problem is we can't really graph this. We can't type it in our calculator and graph it until we get the y by itself. And that is where we run into trouble, okay? I do not have a way to get this y by itself. And I have people say, oh, well, just, just take the square root. Well, I, that's not going to do me any good. I don't know what this value of y is. So if, if, the, if the exponent here had been a 3, I could take a cubed root. If the exponent here had been a squared, I could take a square root. If the exponent was a 4, I could take the fourth root. But I don't know what y is, so I can't really take the yth root. Are you with me? I can't divide by 2 because raising something to the y power is not multiplying by 2. So 2's are being multiplied together, but I don't know how many times they are being multiplied together. So we run into a problem here, okay? And that problem is that we need y by itself but we don't know what power this 2 is being raised to. We don't know what y is. We do not know what y is to raise it to the 1 over y power. Okay, we don't know. So, we need a new notation. Okay? And that new notation is a logarithm. Okay? We are going to rewrite this as log, short for logarithm, log base 2. Now that 2 is like a subscript. You know how like when you write H2O for water, the 2 is a subscript? That's where this 2 is. It's kind of hanging down below. Log base 2 of x equals y. Okay? All right, so what we do is whatever the base was, the base of the exponent becomes the base of the log. Okay? The x is right next to it. And then the exponent of y is what we put over here by itself, okay? Now, people get mixed up. They're like, well, which number goes where? I don't know where the x goes. I don't know where the y goes. I don't know where the 2 goes, okay? And they get that mixed up. So here's how I remember that. The base of the exponent becomes the base of the log. Whatever was receiving the exponent when you were in exponential form, that's what's down low in log form, okay? The base of the exponent is the base of the log. The other thing I remember is that the entire point of logarithms, the only reason we have them is so that we can get exponents by themselves. Well, if the only reason I have a log is so I can get the exponent by itself, then whatever was in my exponent position better be by itself when I convert to log form. And that's how I keep track of what should go where. Okay? All right, so a logarithmic function, okay, is one where we have a log in it, okay? You, you've got your x is in the log portion over here. y equals log base b of x. Notice it is equivalent to b to the y equals x. This one is an exponential. This one is a logarithm or log. They mean the same thing, okay? But logs allow you to get exponents by themselves. So here our y was in the exponent position. We can't graph stuff when y is in the exponent position. So we had to get y by itself. So we convert it to log base b of x equals y. Okay? All right, let's practice that with some numbers. Okay? Let's say I had log base 2 of 8 equals 3. So what happens is the base of the log is the base of the exponent. So 2 is what's by itself. The whole point of logs is to get exponents by itself. So whatever was by itself, in this case the 3, must be the exponent. And then the 8 is what goes over here by itself. Okay? And hopefully you agree with that statement. Hopefully you agree that 2 to the third power means 2 times 2 times 2, which is 8. So really all we did was take this exponential fact and convert it to log form. In my calculator, just watch for a minute. I'll show you how to type it in your calculator later. But in my calculator, I'm going to hit the math button. I'm going to arrow down to log base, which is option A. 
and it will let me type in that the base was 2 and then the 8 was over here beside it. Okay, and it will tell me that that's 3. So it, it knows exponentials and logarithms are the same thing. They're just different ways of expressing the same thing. Okay, one more comment about that. The 8 right here, um, not the base, 2 is the base, but the 8 that's over here next to it is what we call the argument. Okay. So that's just the, the term that we use for this part next to log, not the base, but the other part over on the main line next to it. We call that the argument. Okay. Notice we can convert from logs to exponentials, or if we have an exponential, we can convert it to a log. Remember, if you have an exponential, the base of the exponent becomes the base on the log. And whatever the exponent is, is what is going to be by itself when you convert to log form. Okay. All right. Uh, just as a reminder... Uh, in case you know you've forgotten, we haven't officially you know written it down yet. Okay, the whole reason that we need logarithms is to find the inverse of an exponential. That is the whole reason we need logs. Okay, so I know when you see a log, you don't necessarily think, oh, that's an exponential, but it is. Okay. They, they are just two different ways of saying the same thing. 2 to the third power is 8, and log base 2 of 8 is 3. Okay, I had a student one time who said, you know what? I, I, we learned exponents, you know, in, in school. We learned, oh, 2 to the third power, 4 to the second power, whatever. We learned exponents, and I bet that's why we have a hard time with logs. But if they had taught us logs, then we would think in log form, and we would have a hard time with exponents. And I thought, you know, that's a really good statement. That's a really good way to think about it, okay? We're comfortable with exponents. It's logs that sometimes give us trouble. So we can convert back and forth between them. If you're having trouble with a log, convert it to an exponential, okay? If you're having trouble with an exponential, you could convert it to a log. And we're going to go back and forth between those a lot, okay? All right, a little bit more about the functions. If our original function is y equals b to the x, and b could be any base number, okay? It could be y equals 2 to the x. It could be y equals 3 to the x. It could be y equals 10 to the x, whatever number you have for your base, okay? Now, keep in mind, your base number will have to be greater than 1, okay? Will have to be greater, I'm sorry, greater than 0, and it can't be 1, okay? So that is one little criteria uh, about... Uh, you know, when we, when we write those as exponentials, okay? Um, the inverse of it is a log, okay? And that log is written log base b of x. So, for instance, if your exponential was y equals 2 to the x, the inverse would be y equals log base 2 of x, okay? If my original was y equals 3 to the x, then my inverse would be y equals log base 3 of x, if my original was y equals 10 to the x, then the inverse would be y equals log base 10 of x. Okay, But the general curves would look the same. All that would really change is how steep they are. They would still hit these, this key point of 0, 1 for the exponential and 1, 0 for the log. Okay, So remember our domain of the exponential was negative infinity to positive infinity, and the range was 0 to infinity. Those switch when we talk about logs. In logs, the domain is 0 to infinity, and the range is negative infinity to positive infinity. Exponentials have a horizontal asymptote at y equals 0. For logs, that becomes a vertical asymptote at x equals 0. Remember, we trade all the x's and y's. So if y equals 0 was a horizontal asymptote, then the inverse will have a vertical asymptote at x equals 0. The original exponential passed through 0, 1, so, and that was a y-intercept, so our logs will pass through 1, 0. It will be an x-intercept. Okay, so it's very important that we understand those, those relationships there. Okay? All right. Um, we can perform transformations to log functions. Okay? So remember that key point on log functions is 1, 0. That's our key point. And there's a vertical asymptote at uh, x equals 0, okay? So any log function will kind of curve up to the right, and then it will drop down and approach that vertical asymptote. Now, one thing I want to point out right here. There does not appear to be a base, okay? If it was log base 2 of x, this would be the general shape. 
If it was log base 3 of x, this would be the general shape. They did not appear to put a base on this log, okay? When there's no base given, it is implied to be the number 10, okay? So they didn't write the 10, but it's implied to be 10. The log base 10 comes up so often that they finally just said, you know what, if you want the base to be 10, don't worry about writing it. Just, just know that it's 10. Just leave it alone. Don't even worry about writing it, okay? On your calculator, if you go to y equals, the log button is directly to the left of the 7. So if you press the log button, it assumes that you want your base to be 10 and you don't have to type it. It assumes you want your base to be 10. And then I can graph it, and sure enough, it goes through that one zero point. Now, one thing I would point out when you graph in your calculator, it does not look like it has that vertical asymptote and that the graph drops down right there, but it does. So when you draw it on your paper, please show that the graph is dropping right there. Don't just stop, okay? Go ahead and draw it coming down and put an arrow on it to show, okay? It's because of the pixels in your calculator that it just doesn't have room to show them, okay? All right. Um, one other thing, if you're using an 84, you can, you can do this. If you're using an 83, you won't be able to type it in. Your calculator doesn't have this feature, but just watch for a second. Let's say I wanted, actually, I'm going to leave that in for just a second. I'm going to leave that log x, okay? Let's say that I wanted it to be log base 2 of x. Okay, so in my y equals, I'm going to leave that log x for just a minute. And I'm going to hit the math button, and I'm going to arrow down to option A that says log base. And that's where I can make my base be something else besides 10, if I wanted the base to be a 2 or a 3 or whatever. But when I hit graph, there's my base 10. Notice that when I change the base to 2, the general shape is the same. It still goes through that point 1, 0. It still moves up and to the right. It still drops on the left. In fact, you can see it doing a little bit more of the dropping on the left-hand side. Okay? So it does not really matter what your base is, 2, 3, 10, whatever. It's that same general shape. It just affects how steep it is. Okay? But just know if they don't put a base, it's implied to be 10, and you just hit the log button. If they give you a base, then you will hit the math button and arrow down to log base to fill that in, okay? If you're using an 83, I'll have to show you in a little bit how to do that. There's a little bit of difference there, okay? All right, notice this right here. This says ln, y equals ln of x, okay? Sometimes, remember how we talked about that number e? We, we said the other day we had like y equals e to the x, and we said, oh, that's an exponential function that goes through 0, 1, and it zooms up on the right, and it levels off on the left. Okay. Well, the exponential function e to the x also has an inverse. We would call it log base e of x. y equals log base e of x would be the inverse. Okay. If I trade my x and y, I'd have x equals e to the y, and then when I get the y by itself, I'd have log base e of x equals y. So sometimes I don't show that work. I just know, oh, it's log base e of x. Okay. Well, it's got to have that same general shape. So it's going to go through 1, 0. It's going to travel up on the right and drop on the left. Okay. Because log e comes up so much, log base e, they gave it its own button, just like it, log base 10 comes up so much that we gave it its own button for just log right here, okay? Log base E comes up so much that we gave it its own button, that LN button next to the 4. LN stands for natural log. So when we see this LN right here, we know that it means log base E, but we don't have to write log base e. We just type ln, and ln means log base e. So I hit the ln button. That means log base e, and then I tell it my x. Notice when I graph that, it still goes through 1, 0, still travels up on the right, drops on the left. It's got that same general shape, okay? So ln means log base e. Plain old log means log base 10. Other than 10 and E, you'll have to write down what you want your base to be. Okay, uh, let's see here. Next, let's look at a couple other transformations that we could make with our graphs here. 
Uh, by the way, notice both of these, the domain in both cases would be zero to infinity. They start at zero and they go to the right forever. And the range would be negative infinity up to positive infinity. They're both traveling through that key point one zero. They have x intercept. Okay. What about this one? Well, log base 10. They don't give us the 10, but we know it's base 10 of x plus 1. Notice that plus 1 is not in the parentheses with the x. Okay, It's not part of the argument. Remember, the argument was the, the part over to the side. It's not part of that argument. So this plus 1 is going to cause it to shift up one unit. So that key point that used to be at 1, 0 is going to shift up one unit. It's going to be at 1, 1. But the graph will still travel up to the right and will still drop to the left. There will still be a vertical asymptote right there at x equals 0. Okay? If you want to graph it to be sure, I'm going to clear out these other ones. I'm just going to say my log x. Close my parentheses because they want the plus 1 to be separate. There's my original log x. There's my new log x plus 1. Do you see how it just shifted up one unit? Okay. My domain is still 0 to infinity. My range is still negative infinity to positive infinity. Um, it still has a vertical asymptote at x equals 0. It's just that that key point that was at 1, 0 is now at 1, 1. Okay? Notice this one, the plus 1 is in parentheses with the x. Okay? Well, when it's in the parentheses with the x, something sideways happens. And the sideways stuff is always backwards. You would think it would go right 1 because of the plus 1, but it will really go left 1 unit. Okay? So notice our key point that's normally at 1, 0 will go left 1 unit. It will be at 0, 1. That vertical asymptote that used to be at x equals 0 is now going to be at x equals negative 1. And the graph will travel up to the right and drop on the left. So let's try that one. Log x plus 1. And again, my x plus 1 is in the parentheses. There's the original. And there's my new one. Do you see how it went left one unit? I know it doesn't show the graph dropping very far. That's because of pixels. We know that it does. Okay? So this one has a new domain. The domain, instead of going from 0 to infinity, is negative 1 to infinity. And it's got a new vertical asymptote. The vertical asymptote used to be at x equals 0, but now it's x equals negative 1 because that whole graph shifted left one unit. Okay? These next two, they're ln. That means log base e. Okay, that's what it means. But we have its own button. We don't have to push log base e. We can just say ln. Now, normally the ln function, let's start here at 1, 0, goes up and drops right here. This negative is going to cause a shift. I mean, not, excuse me, not a shift. It's going to be a reflection. Which way is it going to reflect? Well, if we put the negative with the x, it shifts side. I mean, I keep saying shift, sorry. If we put the negative with the x, it reflects sideways. When the negative is not with the x, it's going to reflect vertical, vertically. So it is a vertical reflection over the x-axis. Okay. So think about what would normally happen. Normally it goes through this point 1, 0. It will still do that. But instead of traveling up as we move to the right, it's going to be traveling down as we move to the right. Instead of dropping quickly on the left, when we flip that up, it's going to rise very quickly on the left. Okay? Our vertical asymptote is still right there. Okay? So our domain is still 0 to infinity, and our range is still negative infinity to infinity, um, but it's tra traveling kind of the same direct, uh, different direction. All right, so let me clear those out. Let's do regular ln of x. Remember, that's our regular ln of x function. And if I change it to negative ln of x, there's the original, and there's our new one. Okay. okay, so this one, still a reflection, but this time they put the negative in the parentheses with the x. That means it's a horizontal reflection. If it's flipping horizontally, it's going over the y-axis. 
So that key point that used to be at 1, 0 will reflect over to negative 1, 0. The part that used to travel up to the right will flip over to the left and it'll be going up this way. It used to drop down, but now when that flips over, it drops down here. So notice the domain is now negative infinity to 0. Okay? Our range would be negative infinity up to positive infinity, and there's still that vertical asymptote at x equals 0. It's just that the x-intercept, instead of being at 1, 0, is now at negative 1, 0. Okay? All right, I think that's probably a good start on these log functions for our first video.